Well, hello there, YouTube, and welcome to the continuation of the... Uh, I'm not sure what the title is going to be on this painting, but this is another virtual painting session. And we're going to continue this painting we've been working on for, I think this is like the third stream now. So this is part of a larger painting, as you have seen or may have seen in the first stream. So... Uh, uh, there is a playlist consisting of my live painting sessions, so they should be there in the playlist if you're interested in seeing uh, the way this painting has been developing um, more sequentially. So today I'm going to continue to build around this section of the face. Uh, still haven't quite figured out what to put behind here, um, so let's just continue working here. So since this is going to be the third layer, um, I'm going to add a little bit of medium onto the paint or onto the painting so that I can get the um, luminosity back in the painting. Uh, this is called oiling out, or you can call this applying a couch. Uh, applying a couch means that you are going to paint into the area that you're applying the medium to. Oiling out just means you're uh, covering all of the surface, not necessarily going to cover or paint over some spots. So let's just say we're oiling out. Uh, so I'm just using Neo McGilp, hey Stephanie Thompson, hey Mino. Uh, no, we don't have an opening tune here. It's not that kind of show. So this is just Neo McGilp, and I'm using my. Um, Princeton Catalyst Polytip Bristle Brush. Remember that the painting is unfinished until it is photographed and posted on my Instagram or something like that. I usually don't show progress images anymore on Instagram just because, um, you know, if somebody looks up my name and then they find an unfinished painting, like a picture of an unfinished painting, it's from a business standpoint, it's not a good thing. So, um, I tend to only post images of completed paintings. So um, whenever you see something in the painting that's different from the reference, you don't need to let me know. I know that it's different from the reference. Um, and that's part of the topic for today. Hey Canvas Dancer, uh, let's see here. You've been here since the first part of the demo, but have been quiet. Oh, I'm glad that you're here. And remember, um, please feel free to ask any art-related questions during the duration of the stream. Usually goes till about 9 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time. Usually. Hey, Leonie. So, um, so the painting is unfinished until it is photographed. It's also at an angle. Uh, the painting is at an angle with respect to the camera so you're going to see this with a little bit of distortion so just bear in mind that it's not going to look exactly like the reference. So I want to talk about something um, that I'm going to call visual dialogue uh, today as I continue to develop this painting. Uh, visual dialogue, um, I'm sure if you google it you'll find a bunch of different um, definitions or terminology I'm just going to say uh, visual dialogue is going to be an open conversation in your painting as you are painting it. So I'm going to introduce that idea to you uh, that the painting is unfinished until you say it's finished. And so in the middle stages or in any stage there is a visual dialogue meaning that there's going to be some stuff that you put in your painting that's mere conversation. Uh, and it's getting you towards the point of the completed painting. So in a, in a visual dialogue, it is part of a painting that is not entirely correct, not entirely finished, but it is part of the conversation to get you towards that more completed uh, stage of your painting, if that makes any sense. So uh, my teacher, John DeMartin, one of my teachers, uh, I've had many uh, amazing teachers in my lifetime. John DeMartin would say things similar to that. A drawing is a series of corrections. So um, it's, it's, it's not a linear pro uh, process at all. Hey, David Bonnet. 
Um, so this is not a linear process, meaning it's not that every every uh, mark or every brush brush mark goes down perfectly, and that the painting just magically uh, comes into fruition. Uh, it, there is a visual dialogue. There, there's a series of corrections that needs to happen, unless you're working in a paint by numbers kind of way and uh, everything is methodically planned out uh, which is fine if that's how you want to work but that's not how I like to work and that's not how I um, teach my students. I, I teach my students to be able to uh, see and interpret shapes and to be able to work uh, with shapes and to be, uh, paint freely Okay, so canvas dancer is visual dialogue similar to the painting tells me what it needs. You know, um, uh, it's a tricky. The painting, t no, I wouldn't say the painting tells me what it needs, but I would say that you're in the in the direction of what I'm getting at. So, uh, in a sense, yes, the painting tells me what it needs, in in that I look at it and I see that. That mark is not supposed to be perfectly rectangular. So yes, you're correct. The painting does tell me what it needs. But there's something deeper to that. Uh, it, it is that I make a statement. Yes, I can see in the painting that it's not correct. But it's an ongoing conversation uh, of sorts. That, that's what I mean by dialogue. Uh, that, that, that's exactly what I mean. It's just uh, we need to consider the actual... Uh, yeah, there you go. Well, art equals communication. There you go. Both of you get it. Both of you understand me. I'm happy. I feel understood. <laughs> sometimes uh, it's hard to put visual things into words. It's a mind bender. It's weird. Because usually these things are silent in my head and I usually don't verbalize them. And um, and I, it's fine if you see something in the painting, for example, that's not like the neck is too long, the eye doesn't look like her eye, the jaw is not correct, the mouth is not correct. Like it, it, it's a dialogue, so it's all in progress. And uh, I I warn you if you show your unfinished artworks. Uh, towards the public or towards some friends. They, they just don't usually understand that a painting is in progress. It's a difficult subject to talk about, but it's something that I want to be understood more. Oh, thanks, Canvas Dancer. Hey, Anush, uh, thanks for watching from uh, Por Portugal. So you see, I started with the, the chin. It's just a somewhat relatively simple place for me to start. Yes, it, I can uh, see that it's very difficult to discern what the colors are on the palette. And that's because I'm using lead white. It's fairly transparent, uh, transparent looking. And uh, it, it's not quite that I'm looking at the palette as I'm mixing and like this is exactly the color that I need so let me put it there it's just like the visual dialogue it's an ongoing thing in a sense I want you to be able to relax as you're painting more I want you to, to relax just just chill <laughs> just chill when you're painting don't don't think that every mark has to be the final mark, that, that every brush stroke has to be the last brush stroke. Again, it's difficult to put visual things into words.
April. Uh, let's see, am I glazing or is there really a lot of paint on your palette? It could be the angle, but it looks like you're using very thin paint. I am um, not using any extra medium here other than the Neil McGill that I added on uh, the painting. So, so now I'm, I'm painting more opaque. It just looks very thin because I'm using lead white. Remember, lead white has this property of which I can use more of it without raising the value, thus allowing me to have thicker uh, consistencies of paint. It's uh, the ideal uh, white to use for portraiture, though you can use anything. And this is the part of the painting where things really slow down. So this is the third stage. And since this is a third uh, layer, at least on the face and the hands, and um, you know, let me know. I can tell by how many of you are interested in watching this, whether or not to continue this. I would like to show you the whole process, or at least as much of it as I can. So please uh, share the word with other potential viewers. Yep, no problem, April. And I've had a few questions about my um, online classes and there's been some confusion about um, what the beginning is of my online classes so uh, I want to clarify that um, so whenever anyone joins I will I usually will send you the welcome package which is a playlist of the projects and directions for the online class which means starting with um, project 2 which is the one I suggest everyone begin with and then building up from there. Uh, I say usually because I'm away from the computer on Tuesdays, and, or I'm away from the computer on Sundays and Mondays. So if you don't get a response from me on Sunday or Monday, it doesn't mean I'm ignoring you. It just means I'm away from the computer. So I've had some confusion about that. I just want to clarify that. A canvas dancer. Yeah, I would love to show the whole process. I, I do hope there's enough interest to. Oh, thanks, uh, Minnow. So, um, I do this thing where I close one eye, usually my left, and I hold a, a horizontal, and then I keep my arm straight, and then I move it towards the reference. So I'm trying to compare the angle of the jaw with the uh, jaw on the model. And I do this uh, whether I'm working from a picture or working from life, it's all the same. So this way I can get the exact angle for the jaw, at least as close to it as I can. Hey Joe PY. Hello, hello there. Alright, so now the shadow color. This is, uh, believe it or not, still the first little um, raw umber sketch uh, that's that's there. So that, that definitely needs to be painted more thick. 
So we're going to go with orange, molybdate, and cobalt blue. Very opaque. And just about the only way I can get an opaque dark is if I use cobalt blue. Hey Helen, welcome back to the stream. Oh, thank you for uh, wanting to see the whole process too. Add some vaxazine purple. Cadmium red. It's a really uh, nice and kind of thick dark value. So the cobalt blue makes it kind of heavy. Indian yellow. Dull out the purple. So when you're working from photo references, there's going to be a very, very uh, a big challenge trying to paint uh, shadows, and especially the color of shadows. Uh, I have to paint what I see from the reference, but then imagine what it would look like if the model was actually here. So when you're painting from reference, you really have to um, use a tad bit of imagination. Hey, Brenda. Uh, so just like someone uh, commented, Visual dialogue is very much like it, it, it kind of is like the painting tells you what it's need what it needs and that you just don't quite put the right mark down first try every time sometimes you do but it, it's usually not the case so everything that I place I place down in order to get me closer to what the right answer is. There's almost like a science to it. Uh, there should be. Let's just say there is a science to it. You don't, in, in any kind of science, you don't start with the right answer. You start with a bunch of wrong answers. And you um, test them out. But without those attempts to get the right answer, there's no way that you're going to get it. And that implies a lot of patience, too. For example, now I'm finding out that that wasn't as round before. It's actually sharper, and then the chin actually lifts up a tad bit there. And then the end of the day, in the end of the day, you have to ask yourself, uh, how close to the original do I want this to be? And for most of us, it's as close as possible. But for me, there's a certain, uh, I call it error tolerance. There's a certain tolerance to error, meaning like mistakes, that I can live with. Another um, example would be my teacher would say, um, don't sacrifice the painting for the portrait. Uh, don't sacrifice the painting for the likeness. I think that's what he said. Or don't lose the painting for the likeness. Strive to get the likeness, but don't dwell on it. And you know I've said things like this before. So nothing new.
Hey Jim Adams, I am using bristle brushes. These are size two um, silver brush Grand Prix bristle brushes. Uh, and I uh, have the name of it typed out on, on the bottom of the description box. But uh, just bristles size two silver brush Grand Prix. I like bristles because they can uh, they can pack on a lot of paint. And I like size two because uh kind of like the perfect size for all the middle stuff. And I like filberts just because of the uh the mark making. Not quite as sharp as a as a round, not as square as a flat. Oh, thanks, Brenda. So I changed brushes. Now I've got three of them. So I changed brushes, uh, same type of brush, of course, uh, to mix up the pinkish color for the lips. I'm going to start out with the shadow. And another thing I, I tend to always have to clarify is, yes, the color is not going to look the same here as it's going to look there. This is a painting, and this is made out of wood. Uh, so it's they're not going to look the same. But I choose to use a wooden palette because um, traditionally that's what painters used. And oil painting is a very old school kind of thing, so I like this feeling of using something that was used by the, uh, the old masters for centuries. Not this palette, obviously, but wooden palettes. So I'm still not adding too much information. There was already a value there for the lips. What I'm doing is just adjusting the color, but I will add some more information today. Another um, frequently used saying, similar to what I've been talking about today, is trust the process. So trust the process. Trust yourself. I just cleaned off the brush a little bit with some Gamsol.
Now you see, I'm, I'm actually trying to force myself to stay further back from the painting. It's so tempting to try to uh, be up, up and close. Try to keep yourself as far back as possible. And right next to a bright pink like that, I actually like to contrast it with green. So right next to it, there's going to be kind of a bright cadmium greenish. Okay, so I'm still going to try to avoid going into tons of detail, which I kind of would like to do, but this part of the face is still very uh, unspoken for, not quite developed. So I'm going to push the darkness here and build over top of this dark with more opaque light. So it's going to look weird, like she's been punched in the cheek or something like that for a little bit until I can get it to look the way I want to. Back to that idea of a visual dialogue. Make this more of a greenish skin tone. Like I said, don't panic. I'm making this darker, more pink on purpose. I'm going to kill off some of the pink. Do not panic. That is what I'm saying to you. I'm filling this with dark, covering the entirety of the shape of the plane so I can go into it with light. And working from a photograph, especially with the cheeks, um, the cheeks, it's just, it's a pain, like trying to figure out what should be there. Uh, no matter what, photographs always kind of flatten out the cheekbone structure. Okay, so there's a very distinct plane change here. Yes, I know at this point it makes the cheeks look very poofy. Uh, when working from life, when you're painting this area of the face, uh, with the model's permission, I would suggest to walk up closer 
and really look at the topography of the model's cheekbone structure. This is hard. This, this area is very hard because it is 3D. It's doing all these little things, right? It's, it sticks out, goes flat, curves, goes flat, then curves down again. But it's, it's sticking out in front of you. It's not like one of these planes here. These are easier because they're turning away from you. This, this darn thing is pointing towards you, so it's deceptive. It's very deceptive. And the photograph just doesn't really do it justice. I'm pushing a little more green there. All right, so the chat has been rather quiet, so I'm going to introduce a question to everyone. Let's start off with something, something relatively simple. Oh, we got a comment. So, Menno, some photographs are taken with flashlight, and they're harsh. Oh yeah, well yeah, whatever you do, try to avoid. Working from a photograph taken with a flash. Yeah, try. Uh, yeah, try to avoid that um, as much as you can. So, uh, question for everyone is: This one will be more um, color specific. Let's see. What is your Favorite, let's see, what's your favorite blue? Because there's a lot of fun blue colors. Mine is Thalo Turquoise. That's my favorite blue. Start off with a relatively simple question for everyone. What is your favorite blue? And maybe you can add uh, why it's your favorite blue. Thalo Turquoise, uh, this one is my favorite blue because it is so bright. It's like the brightest blue I've ever seen. I don't really use it too much for skin tones, but when I'm painting a blue object, still life object, it's, it's, it almost glows. So Canvas Dancer Bice from Vasari. Oh, I have never heard of that one. That that's cool. That's something I I should look up. I'm pushing the greenish. I should ask the cost of that. <laughs> That's funny. Because he must have used a lot of blues in that blue series he did. That's a good one. Good art history joke. <laughs> uh, Leonie Ultramarine can use it for so many things. Awesome. Yeah, and uh, please feel free to comment, uh, even if someone has mentioned the blue that you like. Uh, feel free to comment. Speaking of ultramarine, you know what? I can probably use that. Mix that over here. Good call. A cobalt blue for you, Brenda. Awesome. Hey, Michael Jones.
Cobalt Teal, that's a nice one. Brian Wong. A canvas dancer. Bice is a kind of light cerulean blue. And it's very versatile and very buttery. Cool. Gotta look that up. Gotta look that up. I have cerulean blue right over there, so maybe they're similar. Oh, someone's getting fancy. Look at April with the fancy blue right there. That, um, Lapis Lazuli. That would be my favorite if I had it. <laughs> That's the genuine ultramarine blue. Uh, for those of you that haven't heard of Lapis Lazuli. Getting fancy. Okay, so now you can see plain here, plain here. This is the difference. This is a different transition, different transition here. So one, two, three, four, five. Um, different transitions there. And even still, like I, I need to clarify some stuff there. Not very simple, especially with this photograph. And I took the darn picture. Blue manganese thalo mineral. That oh, that sounds interesting. That sounds, even though I don't like the word interesting, but that that sounds very fun to use. I gotta look that up. Hey, Jay Grammar. Oh, thank you so much for watching my channel for over a year. Oh, thank you for your kind words. Oh, I know April. I I can't afford it either. Yeah, uh, lapis lazuli is made from a precious rock, just as uh, Menno has, has uh, written to us. Only found in Afghanistan and Chile. So Maria King's Blue Deep by Michael Harding has a slightly lavender tint and is beautiful for skies. And that's a good, good one right there, because it's very hard to find blues that out of the two work well for skies, I feel. Um, that's a good one to take note of too. King's Blue Deep. Michael Harding makes some really nice colors. I had to push this plane a little to the left. Oh, and the glabella. Hey, Carol. All right, so great comments on the on your favorite blue. Okay, I was mixing up a midtone for the glabella. This little area here. Blues are such uh, unique colors, and I, I've got a lot of them here. I've got one, two, three, four. I got four different blues on my palette.
And if you want to get a really nice transition, I'll give you a tip. Use more paint. Uh, if you use more paint, it's easier to kind of, uh, I don't know how to describe it, but um, easier to work with. I don't want to use the word blend because I'm not really so much blending it as I am adding to it. Uh, but thicker paint actually helps with very smooth transitions. You would think it's the opposite, that using less paint and kind of noodling away at it would make it more soft. And I've done that before, but I've, I've found that thicker paint helps. Okay, let's ask someone a question. Let's see who's going to get this. Hey, Jim Adams. Oh, cobalt. Yeah, that's a good one. The true, I call it the true blue. It's like the right in the middle blue. No worries if you're new to painting or not. Uh, just uh, feel free to comment your response. All right, who's going to get this quote uh, first? Because I, I tend to always use it. Um, the thicker you paint, the, the more it flows. Who said that quote? Let's see who's going to figure that one out first. The thicker you paint, the more it flows. That quote is attributed to who? Because it's funny because that quote has a lot to do, it has a lot to do with uh, the edge work that I'm trying to do. Hey, Minnow. No, I didn't make that quote up. <laughs> my, my quote is, uh, not my quote, uh, the quote is, the thicker you paint, the more it flows. Well, I'm sure if you Google it, it'll probably show the name up, but I wanted to see if anyone knew it by heart. Of course it was Sergeant. Carol. <laughs> um, so Carol got it right. That's Sergeant. Mr. John Singer, Sergeant. A canvas dancer. Uh, so, uh, yeah, the thicker you paint, the more flows is attributed to John Singer, Sergeant, who painted with tons of paint. Uh, is famous for his portraiture. Uh, he's one of the most famous portrait artists of all, uh, of all time. One of the most famous. Yep, Carol for the win with this one. I should have had an index card, a bunch of index cards with me for quotes. That's a good idea. Because I, I myself don't know that many. I mean, I, I don't know them like verbatim. But I kind of know how to paraphrase some of them. All right, let's see. Another question for everyone. If I can think of one. How about this one? This is a good one. And uh, let's see. A question for everyone. What do you think would be the best question for me to ask everyone? 
Going once. Going twice. Let's try to make it art related. While you do that, we can move on to the hands now. Give the hands some attention. Of course, I have to do some more adjusting here. But yeah, what would you say is the best question to ask everyone? I know that's supposed to be my job, right? But I thought I would. Uh, include your opinion don't be shy <laughs> uh, question for Carol when are you going to get serious about painting and join my classes <laughs> yeah if only I was that kind of like uh, you know uh, con uh, convincing salesperson that might be a little too strong uh, who said creativity takes courage I mean I don't know that's a good one we could ask everyone. Okay, so let's let that one be the question for now. Um, it, this is fun. We might be able to keep doing this for I don't know how many different cycles of comments, but uh, let's see. So question from Brenda to everyone. I am making this the question to ask everyone. Wh whose quote is this? And see if you can uh, come up with the answer on your own. Uh, don't just Google it. So if you know the answer to this off the top of your head. Oh, there we go. All right, okay. There we go, <laughs> Carol. Carol for the win again. I think, I don't know. Is that the right answer, Brenda? I would say art takes courage in general, whether it's creativity or not. Dali, maybe? I don't know. Um, I don't know the answer to this one. David Bonnet, how much dedication do you give to art? That's a good question. Good question, very deep question, actually. That goes right to my soul. Um, okay, so let's see. Brenda is confirming that Carol is correct. Um, correct that it was Matisse. All right, so question from David Bonnet for everyone. This is good. This is good. How much dedication do you give to art? How would you answer that question? That's a deep one. That is a deep one. Hey, Ingrid. Welcome to the stream. All right. Good, good, good. Uh, 
How much dedication do you give to art? Um, I can answer that question. I, I can also tell you and explain what I'm doing in this painting while I'm doing that. Um, I can somewhat multitask. Uh, so if you're curious about what I'm doing in the painting, you can uh, feel free to ask that. But how much dedication do I give to art? Um, I'd say pretty much full time between Monday, not Monday, between Tuesday and Sunday. Ah, I get it wrong. Uh, between Tuesday and Saturday, five days a week. And I'm still thinking about it on days off. It's still in the back of my mind. For me, painting is like oxygen. All right, so another one from Brenda who said painting is another way of keeping a diary, which another one I don't know the answer to. Um, so we've got two questions going on. So uh, one is, who said painting is another way of keeping a diary? And the other one is, um, how much dedication do you give to art? Is it something that you do on the weekends? Is it something that you aspire to do full time? Is it something that you only like to do on specific days? There's no shame. No shaming here. So from Ingrid, Courage is picking up a paintbrush and just paint uh, this painting. That is true. A comment from Menno, art, painting, drawing, music is just a way to find con consolation, a way to survive in this world. Oh, awesome. A very uh, uh, deep answer there. So from Brenda, my de devotion to my art is so complete that it has become my source of meditation. Oh, wow. But Jim Adams, I usually only have time to paint on the weekends. That's okay. Don't worry. I um I have some uh, interests of my own outside of art. Uh, that is uh, uh rollerblading or aggressive inline skating, however you want to call it. Um, is what I do on the weekends. But I I only do it on the weekends. So I feel you, I understand. And believe me, I'm still, <laughs> uh, even though I only do this on, the, uh, do rollerblading stuff on the weekends, I'm still always looking up skates and like watching skate videos and, and I understand. But it's not like my full time thing. Hey Ingrid, when you are feeling down, uh, let's see, you don't seem to paint. You know, I can relate to that. Hi, Karika, Karikatura.
Art is the expression of the inner you, is a good one, Ingrid. I'm trying to watch out for a 90 degree angle here. Always be careful of 90 degree angles. They just don't work well aesthetically. Hey Jim Adams, working guitar the rest of the time. I'm cool. Yeah, music and art, they, and music and um, visual arts, there seems to always be nice parallels. Yep, thanks for stopping by, Carol. If I can get enough viewers interested on this stream, we might actually get to do the drapery soon. There's a green drapery in here. So Brenda, the previous quote was Picasso. From Ingrid, being creative is the definition of my inner me. Oh wow, that's deep. So much more profound than uh, what I can come up with. I usually tell people I just paint. <laughs> that's like my go-to. I just paint. That's usually my excuse when there's like a serious conversation going on with family members or whatever. Like, what's your opinion on so and so? And I always say, I just paint. Okay, so possible question How many color paints do we all use? That's a good one. Um, that can be a simple response from everyone. But how many colors are on your palette? I've got uh, 18. 18 colors plus uh, lead white on mine. The question from Maria. Uh, how do you keep your colors from looking chalky when transitioning from dark shaded areas to light areas on the face? Good question. And I think you mean uh, the transition between light, transitions between light and shadow. Uh, how do I keep them from looking chalky, say? Um, so one simple answer would be I use lead white and not titanium. Uh, titanium can be very uh, cold and it can look chalky. However, um, there's plenty of painters that can use titanium white and uh, they don't get anything that looks chalky. Um, so another uh, response to that would be to uh, not go so uh, thin with your paint. If you work really thin and scratchy, uh, then the colors won't really show. The colors that you're mixing won't show. And it can look chalky by default because you don't have enough paint to make the uh, true color show. So there's two potential answers for that question. Very good question. But if that ever happens, if you find that something looks chalky, don't worry. You can always glaze it. It's easier to glaze warmer than cooler. Oftentimes colors that you may think are mud uh, are actually really good colors to use. 
One of my teachers would say, uh, a beautiful color is a color that you can't quite define. Uh, it's, it's a color that you just don't, you can't put a, your finger on it, like what color it is. And yes, the palm is under, palm is actually underneath of here. I seem to have twisted it. So I'll, I'll paint the bottom of the palm. See, there we go, visual dialogue. Yeah, that's true. We can do more of these questions. So from Brenda, who said the object of art is not to reproduce reality, but to create a reality of the same intensity? That sounds like a modern painter. I'm not quite sure. So question, identify that quote. Who said that quote? Uh, so how many layers on a painting is too much, uh, David? I don't think you can have too many layers, to be honest. I mean, there's some painters that have worked on paintings for, like, years. Uh, in particular, like the old masters. If you allow a painting to thoroughly dry, you can return to it anew, basically. I mean, given that you didn't do anything too wild, like start it with linseed oil or, or something like that, but... Um, you can use as many as you want. Um, for example, uh, if you look up John William Waterhouse, he was known to have so many different layers on his paintings uh, because he was constantly changing things all the time. Um, John William Waterhouse. So it's not that there's too many layers to a painting, David. It's that um, you, you need to layer your paintings fat over lean uh, but it doesn't mean that if you get to a lean point that that's the end uh, it just means that you need to make sure that each layer of your painting is thoroughly dry before you uh, you know do something different to it like paint over it for example because you can paint over paintings like Sargent painted over paintings all the time um, I'm pretty sure Velasquez painted over paintings uh, I don't think Bouguereau did, not that I know of. Um, so that's why you can paint over paintings. If you let them dry thoroughly, you can just start them anew. As long as it's uh, completely dry. So comment from Minnow. Mixing colors will give a personal one-time only color every time. This is a, that's a good, uh, yeah, true. Uh, even if you mix two colors of the same type, the ratios are always going to be different, unless you're a computer. Uh, so yes, that is true. I never thought about that. Especially if you have like 18 colors like this. Or is it 19? I forgot. I think it's 18 colors. Let's see. A comment from Maria. Oh, I think I've missed a couple of them. I forgot to scroll. Comment from uh, Maria. Glazing is a good... Yes, definitely. If something gets too chalky, glazing, definitely. But also, don't confuse chalky with sinking in. Because sometimes colors can sink in and uh, they may look chalky. Just because they need a tad bit of oil. Um, but glazing will correct that also. So glazing is like the all-around solution for that. Okay. 
So from Ingrid, you love lead tin yellow, delicate but bright color. Yep, definitely. Lead tin yellow right there. Yep, right there. Uh, comment from Dorina. Have you tried, what's this one? Zirconium silicate white. I've never heard of it. Uh, there's another one that someone mentioned. Lithanope something white that I haven't tried. That's a good substitute for flake white. No, I haven't tried it. Uh, from Canvas Dancer, not a quote. Does anyone have experience with lead white replacement? I assume it doesn't use lead. So safer, but how does it handle? Okay, um, I mean, I'll I'll let everyone answer that one, but I can answer it for you. Um, I've only used Gamblin Flake White replacement for a um, mainly for just demonstrational purposes. Uh, it handles similar to lead white, but it's still kind of got like a more thick feeling to it, like like titanium white. But it has the kind of thickness that um, lead white has. And then of course there's other um, there's other substitutes like someone mentioned. Hey Montana, am I using any medium? Not at the moment, but what I did was I applied Neo McGilp through the entire, not so much here I don't think, but uh, up here and here. So uh, if you see this dark here, that's where the brush had touched here. So um, I applied medium onto the painting and I'm painting onto the medium, but I'm not adding extra medium onto the paint just yet. I, I could if I needed to. If I needed to thin something out, I would add more medium for sure. And I like to use Neo McGill for the most part because it's a it's a moderately fast dryer. And in the earlier stages of a painting, you want to use um, a, a faster dryer. But it's not so fast drying that it's going to uh, settle in like an hour or so, like like some of them, like Liquin, extremely fast drying. Yep, a good flow of questions and answers here. And yeah, if you have any questions that you want to add to the crowd, uh, to um, the dialogue, the uh, stream dialogue, not the visual dialogue, <laughs> um, feel free to ask or comment. So Jay Grammar question, what has painting taught you that you apply in daily life? Mine is to be content with imperfections. Ooh, that's a good one. So question for everyone, and I'll also answer too. Question for everyone, what has painting taught you that you apply in daily life? And that applies to a lot of things. I mean, I learned stuff also in, for example, like rollerblading that I can apply to daily life too. Um, so... For example, painting has taught me so many things that I can apply to daily life. And uh, the biggest thing that painting has taught me that I can apply to daily life, it, it was kind of hard for me to answer because painting kind of is my life. Um, so it's more like what do I learn in life that I can apply to painting? Because <laughs> painting is my life. Um, I'd say for me, painting has taught me to always push the boundaries of what I think is possible um, in a kind of poetic way.
to always try to strive for more, I'd say. Hey, Jim Adams. Uh, no, I'm not using Liquilin. I'm using Neo Megilp. Uh, Neo Megilp. This one. The medium that I used. And I applied a little bit uh, using a brush over here. My Neo Megilp, it usually it rests right there. Uh, that's the Neo Megilp part of my palette right there. That's why it looks kind of like a jelly thing over there. Uh, you can use linseed oil, uh, Jim, that's fine, you can use it. Just make sure you use it um, in the later stages, like after maybe like three layers or so. But you can use it. Uh-oh, be careful, Ingrid. For a true artist, lead white is the way to go. Not necessarily true. Uh, some artists don't have access to lead white, uh, which I didn't know about before. Um, but uh, not necessarily true. I think for a true artist, a true artist can make a work of art out of cheeseburgers if they want to. Uh, it, it's all about the passion and dedication. But I, I get what you're saying, and you know, I, I totally get it. A comment from Menno learned from let's see a study photography the focus get down on the core of something the inner essence nice that's deep right there and patience as well oh uh, so Brenda it taught you to be able to expect progress not perfection oh that's a good one a comment from H uh yeah um on your monitor yeah it's not going to look exactly correct uh, i'm looking at this from two different monitors i'm looking at it from my laptop and my tv my laptop is too blue my tv is too orange so it, it can look different on different monitors uh and for the final um so when the painting is complete for example h i will color correct it I'll photograph it and color correct it based on looking on the actual looking at the actual painting. All right, and that's one of those uh, robots that tends to write things that they shouldn't write. So hold on a second. I'll do my thing. All right, so in the past, I used to say if anyone writes anything that's negative, uh, if it's not productive, then I'll, you will get blocked, banned, and reported. But since then, I realized I've been talking to robots. Um, so once in a while, a robot will post something that's like not really part of the dialogue. So whenever you see those comments, don't worry about them. I'll take care of that. A comment from Ingrid, what paint brands is everyone using? I have so many paint brands. So from uh, Ingrid, painting has taught me patience, explore and strive for better results. Awesome. So comment from Doriana, everything, everything you've tried, you've left it. Um, painting is something you never get tired of. Oh, that's good. Yeah, painting is one of those very relaxing things. I will say, sometimes it can be kind of stressful, but um, for the most part, it's a very relaxing occupation.
All right, so now let's paint in the shoulders. And who knows if you're interested, if you're still interested in uh, the development of this painting next time, I think next time we actually will probably make it to the drapery. So if you're interested in painting clothing, folds and stuff like that in the clothing and the fabrics, that's what I'll be doing next, so. Uh, please stay tuned and share the um, schedule with people you think that would be interested in watching this. So remember, it's Tuesdays and Thursdays around 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Hey, David. Learning and balance. And there is a balance to how everyone learns, I would say. So for paint brands, I've got I've got Rublev, I've got Winsor Newton, I've got Michael Harding, I've got um what else do I have? Gamblin, Williamsburg. I think that's about it. For example, my lead white is, uh, I'm still using Williamsburg, but I, I bought a huge one of uh, from from Michael Harding, a huge tube of lead white. Hey Maria, painting has taught you to never give up. That's good. I um, uh, I believe that there's always uh, painting is one of those wonderful things that you can just always uh, continue to to learn no matter what. And this is an area I probably should just use a bigger brush, so uh, I don't feel like it, to be honest. There aren't really too many plane changes here. This is part of the body that's the most, this is a part of the body that's the most flat. But there will be some plane changes over here. You ever get that feeling where you don't want to use a new brush because you don't feel like cleaning another brush? Because I do that all the time. Oh, thanks, Brenda. A canvas dancer. Yeah, I mean, I'd love to be able to show how I've been, uh, how I'm going to get to the drapery. So Leone use Rembrandt and Gamblin. That's good. Oh, Grum uh, Grumbacher is a good one too, Jim. Hey Remo, what is the best color I use? Um, I don't know how to. I, I'd say uh, the most practical color for me is uh, flake white, lead white. Um, I use a lot of it. I mean. You can see how much of the palette lead white takes up. It's just the most used, I guess, on my palette. Let's see if I can uh, move this slightly down. Now, if the screen goes dark, don't freak out. Uh, don't panic. Uh, I have a very there's a very sensitive cable on my camera or connected to my camera. If I even step on it, it goes dark. Hey Montana, how do I feel about painting a master copy to develop as a painter? 
Uh, I'd say that that's one of the best ways to develop uh, your skills as a painter. I, uh, we utilize that a lot in the online classes. Uh, we do master, I call them master studies instead of copies. Uh, in conjunction with uh, you know, like more short term things like figure painting. Uh, we have figure painting black and white, which we use old master paintings for, but not in the sense of a master copy. Um, yeah, learning from the masters is one of the best ways, and traditionally it, it's what you did when you went to an atelier. Uh, you you reproduced what the uh, the master uh, had painted, like Rembrandt, for example. Like in his in his workshops, his students learn by reproducing his paintings. Um, of course, I don't do that. I have people reproduce Rembrandt paintings, not mine. Um, but it's it's one of the best ways. And there's so many reasons for that. Um, it's it's uh, so many. The um, one is you see through their eyes. You see the world filtered in the way that a trained painter does. You don't copy them, but you learn. You gather insights from what they uh, have accomplished in their own paintings. That's a huge, huge um, topic. So, oh, Ingrid, you, you use Da Vinci Alkyd plus lead tin yellow and lead white. Oh, wow. That is pretty unique. Um, to consistently use alkyd. I found that these paints they pretty much dry overnight. 24 hours I can work on this again if I want to. But I don't know why I had a problem with drying before. Uh, paint drying slowly. And it's winter time so it's cold here so Usually paintings dry slower when it's cold. Yep, no problem, Montana. Yes to clothing, David Bonnet. All right. I hope we'll be able to do it. Uh, I think so. We've got slightly less um, people, I think, uh, watching today than last time, but I think we'll, we'll be okay. If anyone's curious about what this is, this is my uh, fan brush. My favorite fan brush, really. Um, it is a um, size 6 Winsor Newton Monarch. So I think it's supposed to be a synthetic mongoose hair brush. And I just use it to um, try to eliminate glare. Also, at this point, I'm using it to... Uh, smoothing out the paint. Hey, Mano, do you ever use black? Um, or very dark brown. I use black is uh, in a in figure painting when I teach figure painting. Uh, when I teach figure painting, I just use black and white so that it's not um, you know I, I don't introduce the extra challenge of uh, doing a short term figure painting in uh, in color. Um, but to mix in paint, I'll only use black if I'm using like the Zorn palette, like a, a limited color palette. Remember, black is a blue. Ivory black is blue. 
Lamp black is a blue. Mars black is a blue. So black is actually just a very dull blue. But I don't have it personally on my palette here. I just I use um, whichever dark blues or dark reds. Sometimes even green for my darks. And yep, yeah, uh, from Montana, burnt umber and ultramarine blue makes a very good black. That is true. Oh, thanks, Ingrid. Let me see if I can show you an example of figure painting, black and white. Uh, I'll show you one example if I can find one. Um, let's see. I don't know actually. I don't want to get in trouble with uh, YouTube. Hmm. Might not be a safe thing for me to do. Oh, well, here's one. This might work. Hold on a second. Well, this is an example of the type of sketches that we do for figure painting black and white. And this is what I like to use black for for the most part um, for monochromatic sketches. So this was done as a demonstration. Um, so what we do is we look at old master paintings, and this is all done in one in one hour. So um, so figure painting black and white. I use black and white to demonstrate uh, the basic proportions of a human body. Things like foreshortening, like uh, clearly one leg here is more foreshortened than the other one. Uh, gesture, uh, big shapes, um, also value transitions and value so things like that like black is very useful uh, if you're doing um, monochromatic studies like this it's it's extremely useful that's just one example of that and that, that can be true sometimes Brenda So, uh, so yes, I do teach figure painting now. I didn't have that available until recently. Oh, uh, what was that? It looks like my screen went dark for a second there. I apologize for that. I might have stepped on the cable. Ingrid, have you ever been considered by your voice to Bob, Bob Ross? So Susan, oh, I don't think so. Oh, thanks for that compliment. I'm not sure I deserve such a high compliment, but thank you. So this, what I'm doing is actually dry, dry brushing. So if you look a lot at a lot of, um, I'd say, uh, I tend to bring up Sargent a lot, but let's say Velasquez, for example. If you look at the edge of arms, you'll actually see where he's overpainted like this. And you actually go over your previous lines or your underpainting or whatever. Adds a nice fluidity. Just make sure it's not razor sharp. None of these edges should be too razor sharp. And I'm just going to leave the neck a little bit longer. I think it looks uh, looks better. Oh, thanks, Ingrid. Okay, so the arm is relatively round, 
usually I would try to go for more of the anatomy, like the deltoid and the backside of the trapezius. Um, but not so much anatomy is showing here. It's more of a soft and graceful curve. Um, some painters will actually emphasize the anatomy more. Um, I don't do that. Uh, typically, if, if it's there, I'll paint it. Um, but if it's not there, I, I won't overemphasize the anatomy. Like, I could do something like that and, like, push the midtone ever so slightly for the deltoid. But, but you can see on the reference, right? You can, you can see right there, there is a midtone here for her deltoid. Because her arm is actually doing some of the work here to keep her hand up, obviously. Oh, thanks, Jay Grammar. Jim Adams, to soften the edges. No, I did, um, if you're talking about this, it's an aesthetic thing. Um, it's just, it just looks cool to have like a dry brush edge. It, it looks like you're painting uh, outside of, you're coloring outside of the lines. That's what it looks like. Like uh, when you can see, a, like, like this is the opposite, right? I'm painting within the boundaries of the line. Um, you know, this is more or less like cowardly, I guess, compared to this. This is more like, like, um, uh, I guess, uh, confident, more of a confident mark. Whereas this one is like, uh, I don't know, maybe I want this to be out here more or in here more. But I also didn't go in with the background yet. So with the background, I'll probably actually just slice into that line. Canvas dancer. Oh, oh thanks. That, that's what I was kind of hoping for that the um that that would the neck would give more elegance there. So in the online classes, we do one black and white figure painting sketch uh, every Wednesday and uh, a long-term project uh, on Saturdays. It's always good to have a balance between um, short-term and long-term, and I found that that's helped me as well. If you recall the beginning of this one, it was very loose, very uh, rapid mark making. Hey Jim Adams, uh, there, yeah, th th don't think there's any dumb questions. No dumb questions, especially if it's related to art. You know, something that wasn't so obvious to me in the past was how important it is to leave your paints on here. I I used to, uh, sometimes I would leave the paints on my older palettes, but in the past I used to just take them off and try to save them. Uh, but, but having the muscle memory, like I, I really don't have to think much when I'm mixing. And like I, I'm hoping that this will be my setup that I'll have like forever. I mean, I may change some colors around once in a while, uh, but I want this to be the setup that I'll have like forever. Uh, 
All right, the night is winding down, so we've got like seven minutes left. So what do you say we uh, have some more of the interesting, uh, you know, I don't like the word interesting, um, some thought-inspiring questions. What's a good question to ask everyone? I like that you're coming up with the questions and I don't have to <laughs> I don't have to do this much. Hey Michael Jones. Yeah, there's always something to learn from others. Definitely. Ooh, the neck. The mid tones for the neck. So let's go back to the um, wh while you type out your questions to ask everyone. Um, let's go back to the main objective of this conversation, which is a visual dialogue. Uh, a painting is unfinished until you formally photograph it and present it and all that stuff. So. But clearly, I'm still aware, even though I put some new information in here, that there's things that are not correct. There's things that need to be adjusted. And earlier, someone said that a visual dialogue is similar to the painting tells you what it needs. And that's true in, in some, to some extent. Um, one of my teachers, John DeMartin, would say that a drawing is a series of corrections. Um, so a drawing is a series of corrections. A painting is nothing more than drawing with color. So another way to look at it is that a painting itself is a series of color corrections. So a visual dialogue means that every one of these shapes communicates with one another in such a way that by relating shapes, by putting down shapes, your painting becomes more and more real. I think everyone's getting sleepy. It's probably about that time, depending on where you are in the world. But don't worry, I'll be here on Thursday. Same time, 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. There's also some uh, terminology that was uh, it's probably not the most proper, but uh, the saying, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Uh, so the neck was kind of working fine without me actually painting it. So I'm going to try to minimize how much I do on the neck for these last couple minutes. Thanks for posting that, Ingrid and Brenda. There's also some of the hair casting a shadow on the neck. As you notice, I didn't paint that in yet, so. Whenever there's a hit or a, a shadow being casted onto the onto an object, let's just say, um, 
I like to paint what it would be like before the shadow is casted. And then I'll actually add the shadow if I want to. I may not add the shadow being casted on the neck. So from Ingrid, how to start, how to start painting. Uh, well, the best thing to do is if you want to learn how to paint, try to find a method that is a very systematic kind of step-by-step -step approach. Um, if you want to learn how to you know make a thing look like a thing in a relatively short amount of time so um not just with my classes of course but there's other people that teach especially if you can um, find some groups to paint with in person uh you know that that would be a good way to start and just like someone said here uh the zorn colors is a good starting point for uh portraiture or skin tones if you buy the four color zorn palette which is white uh yellow ochre cad red and ivory black that's a good um four color palette to start with hey maria oh awesome yeah i look forward to having you here on tuesdays and thursdays the neck looks perfect no thanks jim thank you um, I think I'll just leave the the neck as it is. So um, I, I may put that cast shadow, like for example, I'm leaving this space here open because I'm pretty sure I'm going to go back in with a, a cast shadow on there. If anything, if anything, someone's got to take the brushes away from me, but um, just soften. Ever so slightly. I don't want that to dry sharp. Then it's brushes down. So uh, remember, if you are interested in taking your painting education with me further, please check out the online classes. Uh, uh, and if you like to just watch the painting videos and hang out with us and chat, that's cool too. Uh, remember every Tuesday and Thursday around 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I am now turning the easel so you can see the section of the painting that we just worked on without too much distortion. So that's pretty close I think to front and center so you can see more front and centered less distortion. Now you can see that it's not as elongated as it may have looked like before oh thanks leone um so michael must feel good to be so far into a large portrait like this oh yeah it does it, it feels nice to be this far along and you know it's the cool part is it's all documented it's <laughs> it's all on youtube so if you missed anything if anyone missed anything you can just go and scroll back to the videos and you can see uh, everything and and next time there, there's drapery here you can see the drapery that she's wearing the clothing I should say the so next time we should tackle the clothing so Maria can I use orange palette plus ultramarine blue add yellow and uh, quinacridone violet yes you can you can actually use any extension from the Zorn palette you can extend it um, and remember, I I uh, did one video a while ago where uh, I explained that every color palette um, should be an extension of the primaries. So you can just keep adding blues, reds, and yellows. Yep, no problem, Mena. Thanks for joining. Hey, Pozwati, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Let's see if there's any last minute questions. Uh, so please share the, uh, spread the word if you know anyone that's interested in painting videos or post it in your social medias and things like that. 
I would really like to continue doing these streams, especially with this like large term, uh, large long term painting. So uh, the more people that are interested, the more I'll be able to do these. Yep, no problem. Canvas dancer, thanks for watching. I'm just going to hang out for another minute to see if any last questions, if there's any last questions. Thanks, Ingrid. Oh, thanks, Maria. Okay, so it looks like we don't have any questions. Thanks for watching, Montana. Alright, so thank you for watching, everyone. So remember, if you are interested in taking your uh, art education with me further, please check out the online classes. Remember, they start at just $10 a month. And you can start at any skill level, whether you're an absolute beginner or you've been painting for several years. You can start at whichever uh, stage in your painting development you are at. Also, remember, uh, when you start, I will send you the playlists for each project. So I send you what I call a welcome package, which has all the needed information for uh, the online classes and of course you can always ask me questions um, I check my Patreon messenger as frequently as I can between um, Tuesday and Saturday once again I wish you all the very best in all of your artwork and I will see you on the next one <laughs>